Tirar até na tata que eu estou. O tal mainei tem aí aí aí. Me chama que é a cota. Que é a coisa de você fazer. Por exemplo, que é a mata. Rob, Tane. Cota que eu estou e me chama que é a cota. Que me atua a tahi. Me faca a tua mãe. Cota. Que vai cota. Não fea cota. Que é fea cota e me chama. So, um, welcome uh, to you all. Uh, first of all, we'd like you to introduce yourselves, tell us where you're based, and who do you work for? And we'll start with you, uh, Yosefa. Tēnā uh, koe, mā lōsu i fua manuia. My name is Josefa Inari. I'm the Director of Pacific Dance New Zealand. We're based here in Auckland City, so thank you for having me. That's uh, our pleasure, Josefa. No hā mō koe. Uh, Rob? Uh, kia ora tātou. Um, ko Rob Mōkaraka mohitaka te ua ahau, he uri tenei no Ngāpuhi Moana Riki. Uh, ki te taha tōku māmā ko ngai tūhoi, ngāti rua pani me ngāti kahungunu oku iwi. Um, yeah, my work is basically suicide prevention and mental health around Australasia at the moment. Kia ora rā. Oh, true. And Tane? Uh, Tell our, our viewers who you are and what you do. Oh, kia ora hoa. Ana mihi ano ki a koe, um, Adrian me e aku a oku nei tua kana sefa kurua ko Rob. Ana mihi ano ki a kurua. A uh, koe a hau e noho mai kei konei. Uh, he uri o nei tahu me rangi tāne he whāngai no tainui. Uh, ko tāne mahu te grei toku ingoa. Uh, tēnei a hau te kaukura mo Takerua Productions. Uh, kia ora, uh, my name is Tāne Mahuta. I'm the um, kaukura, the CEO and Assistant Director of Takerua. And we're based in Wellington um, and... Uh, take theatre productions nationally around the Motu and then internationally when we don't have issues with COVID-19 to deal with. <laughs> mm, <laughs> kia ora, kia ora. <laughs> so first of all, um, I, I want to ask you, and we'll start with you, Tani, how has lockdown affected you? Um, we we certainly were affected reasonably uh, significantly. We're in the middle of our Te Reo Māori season tour, which was on week one of its second week um, at Auckland Festival, it already done one week in Wellington. So the final three weeks of our first term, we had to cancel and bring the, the staff, um, the cast and crew back home. We made that call on the Friday uh, prior to the alert levels on Saturday because of the amount of bookings that just, we lost 23 bookings within a within two day process from the schools. Um, so it just was pretty much on, on the wall and in a way, we were we were well, pretty well prepared for it. We were preparing the cast six weeks prior of what could happen and all the elements of when we would pull shows or not, depending on health and wealth, and the safety of our us going into Skura because we thought we'd be a, a risky hive coming into, well, risky kind of a bee going into different hives and potentially we could be a, a contagion spreader. So we had to really consider that process through. So we brought them back on the Friday and but, oh, they came back on Monday, had a weekend in Auckland and, and then we're into a let level um, three and little before by that Wednesday. So that we had cancelled that. We also had to cancel our, our workshop and our Te Reo Māori season for 2021. But we, what we did is we paid out all the contracts for that. So they all got paid out uh, for that. And then... Um, the um, we then closed the Hokainga down and we've been working from our bubbles ever since until at level two. Um, and in the 18 weeks um, that we were there, obviously no one could go into, into to Hokainga. And uh, even at alert level three, that's our building in Wellington, we only went in just to pick up stuff if you needed it. Um, and then we opened it up to the public and we've got like a skeleton crew in there. So we have at least two of our, our Kaimahi staff there to open it up for, for other um, um, office leases in there, um, the Hotu 2. Māori Sites have just finished up with us, but they've been there. And the um, and for us, it's been that process of um, getting us back to the whare running again and being a hub again. And we're probably now getting three or four in there a day because people quite like being in the space. And once we get to alert level one, which we'll hopefully know shortly um, what, what that situation is, then it's back to open, open for business mm. as usual. But still, with we've got contract tracing happening there, good height, bit stronger hygiene standards, of course, and following the health line and government um, health and safety protocols to make it a safe space where people feel safe to come in there. Um, and we've got everyone tracked and checked if anything um, come if we do get a COVID nineteen case. Well, kia ora tāne. And, and personally, how has this whole experience, this whole thing, affected you? Well, it's been outside of Taki. 
Ducky, yeah, oh. it's been interesting. I mean, um, I mean, personally, in, in our situation, my partner Maria Dear, she she got made redundant, so she lost her job. So certainly, a casualty early on in the arts industry. So that was um, tricky navigating that space. Um, just moved into a, a new home, so this was a great place though to be um, in in our bubble. And because it needed lots of repainting and redecorating, it was like brilliant. We got quite a lot of that done over this period, so that was quite nice to kind of have something else on the go around the mahi but in some cases i've been probably more busier um than i was previously because the amount of advocacy work uh, and different groups that we've been doing to spend time uh just to try and get people up to play with how they can claim the wage subsidies how they can claim the cnz relief grants all that information uh just to help people get it especially our people you know so um we can get the support that's there for us that's been a lot of our focus and working with a lot of other um Māori performing arts groups um to make sure that we're spreading it right across and getting our um touch bases to what's happening regionally so mm-hmm. i restarted he waka Udungi up again that was um uh, set up by nancy brunning out of the national Māori theater hui just so we could touch base with all the mao uh, all the maungai from the different Rohan regions and get an update as to how each region was doing because we didn't really have that information and then be able to kind of start providing that to cnc <laughs> Um, and other areas to help us really um, start to navigate a plan for how do we get through phase one and what do we need for phase two um, and so forth. Um, And the other phase we've really been working on is advocating for more funds for the arts. So uh, myself, Meg Williams, did a um, bit of a lobby to the government, got letters from major organisations or a lobby up because the budget was going to be called in three weeks' time and we knew they were doing a meeting in two weeks' time, we'd heard. So we pushed hard, checked with CNZ that they were happy for us to lobby uh, for... Um, what we're looking for is 30 million a year extra or 26 million a year per, to become permanent uh, uh, 30 million a year um, um, per, um, permanent extra support on top of what the government actually gives and we ended up getting well 25 million came over two years so at least we've got extra support for CNZ to keep doing the job that they've been doing I think they've been doing an awesome job and mm. um, and really been active in this process and just to kind of keep helping that as it goes into phase two. Um, hopefully this will help a little bit more. And it was our way to be able to not just have CNZ knocking on Minister of Culture and Heritage's door because we felt they haven't been really well looked after. When you look at Health to Papa's been looked after, the orchestra, the ballet really well as the special clients. CNZ, I felt not so much in the last two years. So we really wanted to lobby hard and say, You've got 12 to 15,000 artists here in CNZ that they're having to look after, and we don't have the poo here to look after and support that number um, if we're not going to get any more support. So try and give them a little bit more firepower, um, a little bit more fuel to do the, the good job that they're doing. So that's been where a lot of our thoughts in Fagaro have been on a, a wider level on top of the um, as much hands-on touching base with the Fano, our, our casts that we've got, which we're still doing, like creating shows, getting the creative teams to still develop works. Um, we're, um, we're it's keen touching base with them so they know what's happening and trying to get, keep keep them abreast as to how things keep changing under this COVID-19 situation. So, I feel exhausted uh, listening to all the work you're doing, uh, Tony. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. I think, it's the, I think my worry is that I think people holding this space at the moment are getting now exhausted. That's my worry now as we're three months in. Burnt out, eh? Mm, you don't want to have that. No, no, no. Kia ora, kia ora, kia ora Tane. Um, Il Sefa, um, how has this whole uh, lockdown affected you personally and in, in, in sort of with your art as well? Yeah, well, our festival was due to have been launched last week here in Auckland on the 2nd of June officially. Uh, June is the uh, Pacific, as, as our festival month of Pacific dance. So we spent the last 12 months preparing for the launch last week. So. About a couple of weeks ago, the board made the call to me to uh, cancel the festival. They could see what was coming around the horizon. So professionally, we had, you know, it was a very sad time for us to um, cancel everything and all the venues. We had some artists that were arriving from Fiji for this festival, some artists coming up from uh, Wellington as well to be part of this, schools matinees that were all part of this. So for us, uh, it just had to be lockdown of all those activities. On a more global, uh, regional space, the South Pacific Arts Festival was also cancelled just before we cancelled. And so that's, that's our largest, that is our biggest expo for all our Pacific artists. And I had been in touch with a few people in Samoa that wanted uh, to do a bit of a, a joint 
presentation there in Hawaii um, on um, some dance forms. There was a major conference in Australia that was also cancelled on us as well, and that was hosted by a Pacific arts organization there. So it's, it's their way of trying to start up what we've got here in New Zealand, you know, having our Pacific festivals and conferences, our formals and that sort of, sort of stuff going on. So that was probably for us the biggest thing um, to affect all our artists here. We, we provide one of the, the sort of big events that our artists rehearse and prepare for. We're the stepping stone. As soon as they finish in our festival, they go off to all the other dance festivals. So I know that uh, we'll try to main, you know, we're going to try and bring them back next year, just double up the festival next year, hopefully, once we get an understanding on the numbers of the gatherings. Now, so that's how, that's how it's been affecting us. But as soon as it went to lock three, uh, lock down level three, I came straight back to the office and then the, start at the staff started coming in at level two as well. So we went to online. Um, I think that's what everyone's doing. Uh, we've had to make that big shift from uh, doing our live theater shows to booking a venue. And so we've been doing some filming all last week, some online um, footage, uh, heritage stuff that we want to prepare. Uh, the series is called the Transform Series. And we asked uh, 10 different uh, Aotearoa-based Pacific heritage artists to share their practice and their world. And so that's in post-production at the moment. So hopefully in two weeks, we're going to start airing all that stuff. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Yosefa. And Rob, uh, um, how has the lockdown affected you? You had a good rest or you've been working like a, <laughs> like um, harder than any time in your life? No, brother, I tell you what, COVID forced me to have a rest. Because <laughs> uh, like, I was just ready to go. I just come back from Australia, but like everybody else, what I'm hearing from the corridor is things were postponed, cancelled uh, due to the restrictions. So yeah, it was a uh, enforced recovery refuel, which I didn't realise I needed. But um, I'm ready to help save a life any day of the week. But because of the communities and organisations, uh, they had to adhere to all the um, restrictions and you know the framework to keep uh, the community safe. But I was almost at level three. We were still pushing to get Shock Road to the Hawks Bay until I got the big party. And um, that's oh, okay. Slap down. We got the slap down. Uh, but the good thing is um, the people that I'm working with, they're from different organizations, but everyone has lost some whānau to suicide. So they've started suicide bereavement groups, um, action charitable trusts that are yeah. dealing with trauma. So... We want to save a life. We, we just go, as long as there's a breath, there's hope. Yeah. Kia ora, kia ora, Rob. Now, um, have you seen any statistics in that area um, from the lockdown period? And how does it look if you have? Yeah, I tell you what, they're hiding it. <laughs> it's oh, like really? they're hiding the actual real stats. And, uh, and, and I'm not going to mention what the stats are, only because I don't want to be chosen. Those are the incorrect stats because it creates a panic. Yeah. But the irony of it is, brother, we need to be clear with that information. Otherwise, we just keep sweeping it under the carpet. And it's, it's always like there's um, people don't want to be accountable for the figures. Mm -hmm. And those figures are human lives with names connected to Fano. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Well, kia ora, Rob. So we come to our second question, and that is, um, what are you all working on at the moment? And uh, we'll start with you, Rob, because <laughs> we're still on you. <laughs> Bro, I'm working on being happy to be alive every day. That's the first one. That's the first. That's me I'm doing. I've got to make sure, mm. make sure that I like what's in here and in here and my narco. So... But also, you may have seen that the Shopro documentary was released on Māori television. It may not. Uh, was, and so that's going to Māori television and the spin-off, a Māori platform and a, and a basically a Pākehā platform. And it will go further to film festivals. That's not my, that's nothing to do with me. That's the documentary company. But um, 
on that, brother, all I am doing is just trying to connect people in communities, either Aotearoa or globally, who are using uh, tangata whenua indigenous healing methodologies. Because the West have exhausted themselves or are running around in, in uh, well-intentioned circles. Good well. So I'm interested in that, brother. So to Wananga with Aboriginal elders, to Wananga with maybe Cree Indians, Sioux Indians, Hawaiians. So I'm all about trying to connect those groups of, um, of people and methodologies of healing, brother. So, yeah, one mm -hmm. step at a time. Kia ora, COVID. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And Yosefa, what are you working on right now? Um, I mean, we're just, I've done the bulk of the work with the filming, so that's just all over with the editor now, and I guess I'll be called in in a couple of weeks to have a look at that. But I think just like, uh, just like the brother Rob said as well, I can't wait for the borders to go down. I usually exit Aotearoa at this time of year. The older I got, the more I needed to go back home. And usually in July and August, I usually, in the very cold winter months here, I, I actually go home for a couple of weeks. Just to uh, breathe, uh, get my feet in the sand, you know, just get my, my breath going. It's my time to kind of rejuvenate. Um, that's, I'm waiting for the borders to come down. I'm very looking forward to just going home and having a little bit of time out, um, sit in a non light polluted sky, you know, and just have that time out just to refresh and reset for the rest of the year. So that's, that's me on the professional side, but on the profession, but on the personal side, my passport's ready. Where about in Sam, where are you from, Yosefa? Um, I'm from Apia, I'm from Upolu, the, um, the island of yep. Upolu, but um, I try and get out to what we call the Guabax, the bush, you know, just to get out of the town area and um, sort of take that time out there and, and, and a bit, bit more slower pace, you know, and sometimes Absolutely. you just need to just slow down. So I'm, I'm there with you, Rob, as well, at this time <laughs> of year. And Tane Mahuto, what are you working on right now? Oh, we kind of went, um, our kind of gamble we played is we thought New Zealand were doing pretty well. And because we're a live theatre production company, we kind of gambled that live would open up. So um, we kept our production uh, groups with how we worked it with them was saying we've got these deadline dates as to when we can say yay or nay, depending how the alert levels are going and how the community's at, uh, with our hope that we could keep them um, employed and then trying to make it work within the kind of financial challenges of no sponsorship at the moment, lacking in trust funding opportunities, all those things have really come down, but we want to try and keep um, the artists that we've got employed, uh, the contractors we've got employed um, and artists um, employed to keep them in, in the game. Um, the So currently we're just in the middle of discussions whether we can continue on with our third term of the Te Reo Māori season. That will happen um, uh, from the 20th of July. Um, about 56% of the schools have come back now and said, yep, they're really keen. And so we're really pushing for that for our board who we've got a decision on that tomorrow for that sense, that sort of things. We've also continued with Sing to Me, which is a play by Alex Lodge and directed by Miriam McDowell um, with a great uh, design team, uh, Jane Hakaraya, Tudor Hoskins is uh, in the mix, the Ihe Butler. Um, and so we've been working on the creative design of that show in lockdown. So we're just doing that through our Zui um, um, Wananga, Zananga. And um, the, so that's been really great. Um, and what we're doing there is we can't do the performance of it, but we're going to rehearse it, get it ready for performance for next year. So it means that we can kind of um, keep those people employed, but also kind of drop the cost of not having to do publicity, lighting, theatre hireage, all those, those elements in that marketing and save that for next year in terms of that front to make it a bit more viable. And then we've got Pohutu, which is a dance work by um, Bianca. His lock and Ron um, Pierce, who did it at the Camo Festival last year and Tempo Dance Festival last year. We're taking that on a five city tour in September, um, the, um, late August, um, September this year, which we think venues will be open and, and good to go for that. So, <coughs> part of our focus is you look at the wider ecology and you look at the technical companies, a lot of jobs have been lost there. So, my thinking is if we don't start with doing live when we can we may lose that part of our ecology completely they'll either go to film because that's where there's good potential for that to go through and we'll lose it from theater or they'll close down completely so if, um i think a lot of organizations have made those decisions to kind of delay to next year and just 
write 2020 off. But my worry is we may lose that part of the ecology and we're ready to go in 2021, but those companies aren't and we can't do live performance shows in that vein uh, for those who need those those technical elements. So for me, it's seen the whole wider ecology and how do we keep us in the game, in the game, so we can continue on. That's where Mm. our was kind of coming from. Well, kia ora, kia ora, uh, Tane and uh, everyone else. Um, right now, we're going to the next question, and I, it, it's a um, relevant question uh, for you, for you uh, fellows who've been in the industry for quite a while now. What has been the um, highlight of your career? And we'll stay with you, Tane. What's been the highlight of your career? Uh, I'm going to go two highlights. Uh, one, uh, internationally, in terms of fulfilling my performance dream when I got to work with De La Guarda, Argentine Aerial Theatre Company, which I auditioned in London. Oh, gosh, that's been a while back now, back in 1999, um, I auditioned there. Um, it's one of one of 14 lucky cast members who got selected out of 1,800 people who auditioned for that show. So that was a huge coup for a Kiwi. And I was the only one from the Southern Hemisphere, um, apart from the original Argentinians who created the show from the Southern Hemisphere in the show, because obviously it was in New York or London. So mainly North Americans or um, Europeans were in the show. So that was really great to bring a Kiwi influence in there, but also a Māori influence because it was a very tribal energy. So I could bring that element. And that was, I think, a point of difference that I... That, um, made that point of difference for me in auditions. So we're like, oh, what's that energy? You know, that's 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 totally what we're looking for. That guy, you know, that's it. You know, so that was quite a cool little point of difference there. And to spend five years with that company, um, uh, touring in different continents and um, being able to share your kind of dream arts and sports. I love arts and I love sports. And this show was both, you know, combined together. So your dream show. So that was great. Amazing experience. And then probably for me, coming back from that experience and then, and then coming back home to bring those Tonga back home and when we built Maui, Women Against the Gods, of which, um, Adrian, you're one of the, in our pilot pre- presentation of that show when we did the first presentation of that at the fire, but then taking that to the St. James and Wellington and the Civic in Auckland and Isaac Theatre Royal and Christchurch was amazing. And just showing that New Zealanders could pull off uh, an event with a kind of a spectacle size and um, techno- technical flying that in, in a way actually was first in the world to beat Wicked the Musical and and on Broadway and also um, the musical in um, uh, God Mary Poppins on the West End in terms of aerials beyond the Presenia March. So we were pulling that off first. Yes, we did have London climbers helping our Kiwi climbers, but it was our tech crews that did it. So good old Kiwis pulling it off, you know, number eight wire, turning it up, making it happen. So that was pretty cool, kind of showing that we could do amazing things at home, you know, didn't have to go overseas to do it. So yeah, that, that, that were probably two of my many, many highlights of my life. I've been very lucky. Yes, yes, absolutely. I remember going to Delaguada. That was a it's a beautiful show that was. Um, and uh, thanks to you, we got I got to go. Good times um, in Amsterdam, yeah. wasn't it? Great times. Yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll go to you, um, Rob. What's been a highlight of your some highlights in your career? I'll tell you what. The main one is actually Strange Resting Places, which is oh, yes. an a Maori story set in World War Two, uh, Italy. Because, it, uh, because of the amount of research we had to do over five years and to delve into our whakapapa and for Paolo Rotondo, my, uh, my good friend, going into his whakapapa and bringing these two cultures together or reuniting from the 1940s back into the 2000s. So uh, that was a privilege because basically we're weaving all that toto, all that waido, all that mama and all that healing in one theatrical way to a package, which took us internationally. Um, and, you know, it was because of Takiroa that helped us get that started. So there were different dynasties <laughs> that are, you know, we've got the Tana Mahuta dynasty at the moment, but different <laughs> dynasties. <laughs> dynasty, yeah. We've got um, Amanda Hiriaka. Hiriaka as well, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, but the main highlight now from all those learnings and, and going to festivals is shop bro confessions of a depressed bullet. It's a kaupapa aroha, kaupapa oranga, mō ngā tāngata katoa, and it bypasses the hindi ngaro and goes straight to your heart. Mm. And that is, uh, that's my main, thanks to my Māori superpowers and my theatrical superpowers, I've combined <laughs> this again, just like strange resting places, to infuse whakapapa and healing and aroha and lights. So yeah, that's me. Oh, Gilda for that. And, uh, hey, Rob, can I just jump in and say, I'd love to see a Thrill Māori version of Strange Resting Places make a comeback and see it that way. So that's something on the Fakar at the moment. So just putting that out there. Well. 
<laughs> We'd love to produce that, bring that back for at, at a specific oh. year that could work well on the anniversary side of it. So there's already, we're already working together here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was one we'll of, one of the most I've ever seen. Places, amazing. Yeah, kia ora, kia ora. Sefa, what's been some of the highlights of your career? Yeah, I, I, just before I answer that, I, I also just want to point out that I saw strange rest, resting places in American Samoa um, when we were on the tour together in 2008, and I just thought it was beautiful. Um, so did the Samoan community there that watched it as well. So, yeah, just, just as you said that, um, I was thinking about you and Paolo <laughs> and that wonderful time we spent there in Samoa. Uh, I guess for me, the highlight has been um, getting this organisation here to 10 years. Um, Pacific Dance New Zealand celebrated its 10th year of existence this year. And it's always been uh, something that our Pacific communities have been talking about for many years, that there is, uh, I guess, like an office that they can go to and talk out some of their ideas about what they want to do. And there was also a push from our elderly community that there is a Pacific focused organization to keep our, our heritage dancers alive here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and also wanting us to get more into education. Uh, I think they saw that the language weeks were coming up and that one of the, one of the really better ways for our young children to learn the language if they don't have it at home which unfortunately is a growing thing here in, here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Our younger parents don't have the real or that background and there's no grandparent in the house. So it was a real big push for our elderly community to push me to get into that work, you know, to be involved with schools, getting um, the language weeks, getting tutors in there to teach the young children and in health as well. Uh, to get out there to our elderly people, you know, so we run programs for our elderly people here, our over 65s. Um, it's a physical program just to get them, you know, the arms up, get the ladies to uh, move their shoulders so they can comb their own hair and the guys moving. Um, so that they're not bound sitting down. So it's all that, all that stuff that this year has been a real good um, celebration that, you know, even though we do theatre stuff, um, we are very kept quite real by the request that comes from the communities. We go and do the theatres and that's something I love doing. It's a bit of my background, but I always, always uh, maintain that, you know, we are guided by our, our elderly, older community here who feel like if we're going to be around, we need to be um, around for our people, you know, our Pacific communities. And so this year's 10 years and I was really delighted, you know, that this year we even though the COVID stopped our big birthday bash, I, I was glad that we moved to the digital space as well, because that's a new thing for us. And it'll be a new thing because we are a large diaspora community. You know, there were, especially the Pacific, there are more of us now living overseas, even Samoans. There are more Samoans overseas. So we've got a lot of work and I love that we do it from, um, from here, from, you know, Tamaki Makaura, we do it. You know, we're going to beam out from here and lots of people are going to be connecting to dance, uh, music, culture uh, from, from, from this place. Mm, kia ora, Josefa. Now, <sighs> theatre and performing arts um, it, it is sometimes being seen as quite political. And we've got the Black Lives Mo uh, The Black Lives um, uh, the glass matter. Hope up are happening now. Um, in terms of theatre, how important do you think its role is in continuing the change in people's attitudes and, you know, uh, not just theatre but dance as well? Just by seeing brown faces on, on the stage and all on the screen or, you know, how important do you think that is? And we'll start with you, um, Rob. Brother, it's it's deeply important that the arts are there to reflect what's happening in society and to put the wedle, that, that challenge out to people and just yeah. be, because that, that, that construct is a, is a safer construct than uh, going up to the police and telling them what time it is. 
<laughs> and, uh, and, and, and another way, it, um, it's also sometimes depends on how it's done. It's, and it's an easier way to absorb and process what's being reflected to you because it's, it's not just cerebral. It's also way to a, the way that the performers are uh, uh, getting their message across. So it's extremely important, brother. That, uh, not just artists, everyone stands up for what is right. Not, yeah, just for justice, brother. And it's scary for people to look at self. It's very scary. Who am I really? And then when something challenging like this, which is universal, happens, it makes people scared, makes them angry. Because I know anger is fear, fear is anger. But the artists and everybody everywhere should just be putting their hand up and say, that's enough. I'm not standing for this. This, this is my facado and this is how I'm going to help. Mm, kia ora, Rob. And Tane, how old facado? Yeah, yeah, Kia ora, a total totoko of what Rob's saying there. I think um, the arts is a great line to your, our communities to share stories, share perspectives, and r- run that line um, of where the political discourse is going, um, and and also cleverly because we can do it hardcore, hit the middle, but we've also got the ability with humour and that elements to really find a way to um, open that bubble, that window for people to come in. And, and take that experience and be able to mull it through and hopefully be that change that sets that light bulb on, on them for them. It's, and, and that's for me where the art is. It's that ability of how do we get um, these messages across in a way that gets people into the mix so that they can really sit with them rather than, and we know change is very hard for people to take. So you have to find a way to um, cleverly um, um, entice them into the journey to um, be thinking these thinking uh, thoughts and 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 be provocative to them in, in, in clever ways. So I think that's the the strength of artists that we applying our, our trade and our way of thinking a lot in understanding how can we express ideas and thoughts for Carl to our communities to our audiences in a way where they'll go away enlightened by an experience and at least take time to consider it um, in the middle of their very busy days that they've got in their busy lives. To consider mm, okay. mm. only for consideration can change happen. And you, uh, what what's your opinion in that area? Uh, well, you know, I come from a fairly conservative society, uh, Pacific people. Uh, we are very um, precious about the way that our heritage dances are performed and who performs them. So I know that in this space where we are in New Zealand, I'm a very big advocate of dance as being a way for our young people to express themselves and engage. And I'm always conscious that our young people are very nervous because their language isn't very good. You know, they, they, haven't, they don't, haven't been brought up in that cultural work. <laughs> many, of our, many, many of our younger people have never even returned home. Mm. let alone their parents. So there is a huge uh, gap. And for me, I'm always, um, I'm always conscious that uh, part of my role is to encourage our young people to express themselves. If they can't do it through a speech, if they can't do it through something formal in that manner, that they can dance it out, perform it out. And I know for lots of our young people, they can they feel a bit more free and a bit more in touch with themselves if they can do that. And and that our older people are able to understand where they're at. It's very much what the um, you know the corridor that's been said about reflecting our own space and our environment, and also using it as a tool. You know that we all there is a bit of a challenge coming from our young people. They don't feel like they're locked in the 1960s and 70s, or in my case, the 1980s. You know, they feel that we um, were probably a little bit stuck in a museum and out thinking about the way our young people should conduct themselves. It's a huge population. The contribution of that demographic of our Pacific kids, it's it's huge. They're they're about to outnumber the over 50-year-olds here in Aotearoa. So I'm, I'm kind of always thinking that as long as the dance form is coming from a place of truth, you know, a, a place of, um, of honesty, um, it's got a really important role to help us move into the 21st century. You know, it is a different time. Today, I just saw, talking of drama, I just saw that the 118-year-old uh, 
court building that the German colonizers built finally was burnt down and brought down in Apia. Wow. That has been such a symbol of division for the Samoan people because there are old Samoans that don't want to look at that building. They don't want to be reminded every day. And then we have the more new generation Samoans who feel like, but it's a piece of artwork that comes from a particular kind of architecture. It's the only one of its kind. So I felt a very big, you know, sigh of relief today that Samoans now can let go of their past, you know, not feel like they have to hold on to that because some of that's very full of pain and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I think young people have got their own pain that they're addressing and dealing with and yep. um, dance is a good way for them to express themselves. So I, I think that's going to be one of those sort of art forms that are just going to grow over the next two generations, you know, until mm -hmm. we finally settle ourselves as new citizens here in Aotearoa. Oh, thank you, Yosefa. I have one more question and, um, what advice would you do? And we'll stay with you, Yosef. What advice would you give young up-and-coming practitioners of that art form? I give this advice at the end of um, each year, right, uh, to the third years as they leave at the schools. My biggest advice is if you're leaving, if you've finished your third year, my biggest advice is to look left and to look right and look at the new collaborators that are right in front of you, you know, before you go into that career. And some of them are going to be very lifelong partners and collaborators. And also, you know, think about um, what, what you're just about to walk away from, that big three years of study that you've done and what you're about to drop so that you can be your own self. But my biggest thing is to stay together, work together with the people that you've been collaborating with and then what I say to people, young people who are about to go into the school, I'll always say to young people, you know, make sure that you don't take it personally because I used to take it personally when you were constantly told you couldn't, that was not correct, you're not moving properly. You're not, so try not to take it personally because many of our young, especially our young Pacific Islanders, they will leave those programs. And my thing is like, do not ever leave a program and be thousands of dollars in debt because some one asshole teacher was mean to you or did not understand where you came from. I think our younger ones are lucky now because there are older Pacific Islanders that have been through the institutions. So they've got someone to call and I'm always trying to encourage them, get a friend, call a friend and check in. You know, check in with someone who's been through that. But the first one is, you know, try not to try not to let yourself really be pressured down because um, the worst thing I want is another failure. You know, especially in our systems, I don't want our people to fail. You know, I want them to be encouraged. But I also know that our institutions aren't equipped to deal with some of our our issues that our young brown men and women walk in with. So that'll be my own thing. Is like you know look to the left, to the right, you know, be good friends with those people that you're with. And if you're about to start the journey, you know, just, uh, just believe in yourself, you know, take a breath, don't punch the tutor, step out, <laughs> step back. <laughs> yeah. I can't find yourself. Uh, uh, and tell me, what, what advice would you offer to young up and coming theatre practitioners? Um, first thing I, I know, and most of my tutoring has been in dance um, uh, back in my classical ballet days and kapaka days, um, and especially ones who are about to go into school of dance or when I teach uh, kapaka at school of dance, which I'm doing at the moment, it's in school of dance, um, have that quarter with them is to actually really remember what your passion was and why you've come to the school and why what you remember about that because schools and institutions do have that situation of kind of breaking people down and, and making you forget that core reason why. And that that core cool reason, that passion, that reason that makes you, when you dance, feels like a million dollars, you know, and you just, and all your worries just disappear for a while while you're out in that bliss. Don't forget that because that's the most powerful reason for you to get through challenges, injuries, um, challenging teachers, um, challenging co-students, you know, in terms of things, um, situations that come up in life, bullying and all those elements. So, um, 
always hold on to that and try and know that 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 passion there is going to be your kind of your energy your your um your um battery inside that's going to keep you going keep you keep you happening second one definitely is what um yourself was saying your people that you're training with at the moment are going to be your co-collaborators for the future so be, it's about building bridges with people uh, you need to navigate this industry it's not an easy industry so you need every bit of support possible um it's not an independent on your own actual activity and i find that probably theater tends to be more group where dance tends to be a bit more individualistic i think it's come out of the competitions and to realize that that's actually not the way to go you have to work together and um you actually get further if you work together um um and i found that in when i was auditioning in london everyone was individual on their own i felt what two or three people were going to auditions would learn that that information together share it on the side so we were all good and hope you'd all got through the next round the next round because you had your team going through to help you through because it was tough you know so and it was just like change that game plan just change it it was it was, it was a great way of making us get work um and the last thing is um as you build your collaborations inside try and network try and get out see shows see what yeah. this industry is saying so you're relevant but also get to meet those who are creating shows out there in the, in the industry we're actually really, really not that we're only one one um what uh, one thing removed from each other in terms of our contacts just just down the road where we are come on and meet connect up because they're going to be the people who are, are going to be employing you in the mix but they've got to know who you are to know who we're going to be employing as well so it's not one way traffic it's got to be both ways traffic in terms of that but it's like a phenomenon. I got and, and and from that you have a beautiful time. People enjoy each other, and um, and that's why for me, Tokaing was such a key thing to build that because I mean, from the Takiro old days, that theatre space it just had communities coming together, being in there. You met up with people, and that's how stuff kind of happened, just by osmosis, being in the room together. So at least with Tokaing, we've got a, a hub, a space where that can happen. It's those off chance discussions that happen in the corridor that end up another project happens or um, which is the kind of the unseen forces that work that when you're in the same space together, those um, collaborations and collisions happen, which are beautiful things. Short of time there. And, and Rob, we'll leave the final word with you. Uh, bro, first of all, my first advice is run! Run <laughs> far away! Get to safety! <laughs> <laughs> Um, phone a friend. <laughs> but, phone the doctor. Phone the doctor. But I'll be straight up, brother. So I, when I had my massive mental spiritual breakdown in 2009, I had to see a shrink um, because it was it was devastating to myself, my whanau, and my tina. I was cut open from from being shot. Um, and I, he's, the shrink said, "Can you explain what your industry is?" And I explained it, and the shrink said. Your industry sounds bipolar. And then he said, now add your depression yeah. to a bipolar industry. <clears throat> you can see how things escalated. And I didn't know that because I was just being me. And, and when you don't know and you're operating in such a way, you think that's the normality. And don't get me wrong, the arts are amazing and they're beautiful. Uh, but it's also how to make sure that you're protecting uh, your, your mind your spirit and, and your body and your environment is key. So you're talking about the tutors, you're talking about the schools of, of learning. There has to be a tikanga, a safe framework around everything that we do because in the Pākehā world, we're called actors. But looking through a te reo, uh, not te reo, through a, to a, through a te ao Māori lens, we are conduits. And we are expressing wairua and emotions in such a way that we are channeling. And we need to be able to protect, have a tikanga around that, no matter what culture you are, whatever that looks like, a framework of safety to go into that realm safely and come out and to close it off. And that needs to be a daily practice for everyone because you hear people go, oh, so-and-so spun out again, on oh, a typical, da -da -da, and I'm thinking, your whole your whole framework is unsafe. Mm. You know this, and we all know this, personally and professionally, the safer you feel, the further you can push those boundaries. Yeah. yeah. Mm. That's me. Oh, can't uh, and, and that's a, we'll leave it at that, but um, thank you all for uh, coming on the scope up. Mihiana ki a koutou, i koha mai, i o koutou wā ki te ni kaupapa i te ni ahiahi. Um, ko te tūmana ko um, mō ngā tau e haere ake nei me kia pai ai te, te haere nei 
e a Manuelo Po uh, 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 na leira tena kotou katoa. Kia ora. Kia ora, Adrian. Thank you, Adrian. Beautiful. Thank you, gentlemen.